Hello, everyone, and welcome to the sixth and final session in American English Live Series 18. We are so excited that each of you are here with us today. My name is Chris, and I'll be with you here today along with my colleague behind the scenes, Elena, who will be the moderator, helping answer your questions and responding to your comments during the session. So let's begin today with some wonderful audience comments from our most recent webinar, I Wonder, activities that teach young learners to think critically with Adrian Johnson. First up, we have Zhao from China. They say, it was a great session. I especially like the guess and infer steps to help encourage students to think critically. Next up, we have Antoinette from Ghana. Antoinette says, the use of comics to tell a story is very interesting to me, and I want to try it in my lesson next week. Thank you. Thank you. We hope that lesson went great. We'd love to hear about that, Antoinette. And finally, we have Patricia Diana from Peru. Patricia Diana says, thank you so much for this insightful session. Developing critical thinking skills is an ongoing process. And then as it was shown in the webinar, we can work on this from even early stages with young learners. That's great. We love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development. So please continue to share your thoughts about our webinars by offering feedback through the end of session quiz form or by emailing them to American English webinars at fhi360.org. We may feature one of your comments during the next session. Throughout series 18, we have explored the themes of social emotional learning and integrating critical thinking in ELT. We hope you are able to use the practical ideas we've shared. So here's what to expect today. The session is about 60 minutes long. The presenter will present the material and I as your host will ask questions and make comments too. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. So please share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. When our session comes to a close, you'll have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the webinar, we'll share a link in the comments. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. Once you have successfully passed the quiz, you can expect to get your badge via email within about a week. And we are thrilled to announce the presentation lineup for AE Live Series 19, which begins on January 17th, 2024. Throughout the six webinars in Series 19, we'll explore topics related to building academic skills for success. You can use the link being shared in the chat and comments to receive reminders about Series 19 events. We can't wait to learn with you all then. And now for today's webinar, Metacognition, Empowering Students to Monitor and Evaluate Their Learning. How can we get our students to lead and monitor their own journey towards critical or strategic thought? Every student has a different approach to learning. As teachers, it is important that we create clear and consistent activities that allow our students to think about how they are thinking and learning. We want students to intentionally reflect on one, their desired outcome when beginning a lesson, two, their approach and process while working toward the lesson objectives, and three, what they learned and how they can work more effectively to obtain their desired end of lesson outcomes. In this session, we'll participate in metacognitive activities that can help students examine their own problem-solving approaches while also developing language skills. We will also discuss ways to embed these activities in our diverse classrooms, empowering students to monitor their own development into critical thinkers. And we are pleased to introduce our presenter, Dorea Jackson. Dorea is an online engagement TESOL technical officer at FHI 360 with over a decade of experience 
as a classroom teacher in both the United States and abroad. She began her career in ELT in Rwanda, where she realized that she wanted to dedicate her career to providing educational opportunities for young people and adults. She served as a special education teacher to primary, secondary, and post-secondary students for seven years in the United States. She taught EFL to young people and adults in Dakar, Senegal for two years as a U.S. Fulbright English teaching assistant. She then went on to serve as a U.S. Department of State English Language Fellow at the University of Lome in Togo. Derea holds a master's degree in international nonprofit management and policy from New York University and master's degree in special education from Hunter College. Welcome, Derea. We are so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Chris. I am so happy that I get to talk with you all today about such an important topic. I love creating a culture of metacognition in my classroom because I believe it allows my students to understand that learning is a process that involves making and learning from their mistakes. It involves asking questions, collaborating, and reflecting. And I find that when I create a culture of metacognition in my classrooms, it reduces my students' anxiety and it allows them to feel more empowered and to think more critically and more independently. So let's get started. First, we'll talk about what metacognition is. Then we'll look at the benefits of building metacognitive skills. We'll look at a few metacognitive activities. And finally, we'll talk about how to build a culture of metacognition in our classrooms. But first, I would love for you to tell me what metacognition means to you. When you hear this word, what are, what are um, a few words or a description that comes to your mind? Yes, everybody, it's your turn. So when you hear the word metacognition, what word or phrase or description pops to your mind? We'd love to hear from you in the chat. Let's see, Dorea, we'll give some of our wonderful audience some time to think about what word they come up with when they see metacognition. We have Dr. Azarin Aziz's awareness about one's thinking. That's great, wonderful. Let's see, we've got lots of people joining us from all over the world, letting us know where they're from. Welcome everybody, we're so happy to have you here. So please let us know when you hear the word metacognition, what word or short phrase comes to your mind? We'd love to hear from you. Let's see, we have lots of people saying, thinking about thinking, being aware of one's own thinking. So I think everyone's on the right track. We have Nala and Asar saying, planning my thinking process. Wonderful, that's great. Yes, we've got Rosa also saying, thinking about thinking. So I think Dorea, we're got, everyone's on the right track. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, for your comments. Yes, that's perfect. Those are all important elements or central elements to metacognition. So let's just jump in and talk about um, metacognition is defined as the practice of being aware of your own thinking, which is what you guys all highlighted. So thank you for those thoughts. And so anytime our brain cells get together to create a thought, a feeling, or action, they also send signals back that report on how well they had that thought, had that feeling, or did that action. The brain is just naturally monitoring and evaluating its own performance in order to improve its performance. And this is metacognition. And as we grow from babies into adults, our brains become more and more aware that it's thinking about its thinking. And part of our brain's development is learning how to do this more effectively. And that's where we as teachers come in because we can help our students understand what their minds are doing and how to use metacognition to better understand and organize their thoughts so they can become more independent learners. 
Now, we can break down metacognition into two parts. There is knowledge or understanding how we think and learn, and there's being able to regulate how we think and learn. And in this session, when we're talking about regulating, we're talking about self-regulation, which involves being able to pause between a feeling and an action, or being able to think something through before you do it. So metacognition refers to the process the brain uses to improve its performance in six key areas. So we have knowledge of task, knowledge of strategies, knowledge of self. Then we have the regulation part, which involves planning, monitoring, and evaluating. So let's talk about what these six areas look like within our classrooms. So we have knowledge then that involves knowledge of task. And that's where our students learn how to deeply understand what a task or an assignment is asking them to do. We have knowledge of strategies. And this involves us as teachers sharing strategies for mastering a new concept. It also involves our students learning how to figure out which of those strategies they've been taught works best for a specific situation or task. We have knowledge of self. And this involves our students having a deeper understanding of who they are as learners. It involves them understanding their strengths and weaknesses and understanding that their minds may work differently from their classmates and their teachers. So although they can learn from others, they should not try to copy them. Then we have the regulation part and we see planning. So our students um, need to learn how to create plans that they can use to successfully complete a task, being able to figure out what to do first, second, third. It also includes monitoring. So students developing an ability to ask themselves as they're working on an assignment, how is this going? Is this working? Is there something I need to fix? And then finally, evaluate. This involves students learning how to reflect on what happened after a task is complete and what they can do the next time to improve their performance. So within each of these six key areas, there are specific metacognitive skills our brains are developing as it learns how to improve its performance. But I would like you to tell me, what do you think? are some metacognitive skills. Yes, everyone, it's your turn again. We'd love to hear what you think are some metacognitive skills. So please share in the chat and we'd love to read them out. So Dorea, we've got lots of great comments coming in. People are just super happy to be excited here today. Let's see. Um, so we have Dr. Azran saying he thinks that some metacognitive skills are problem-solving skills and self-questioning skills, okay. which are great. We have Luna and Q saying analyzing skills and Kava saying problem solving. So lots of different people are saying different types of skills, um, concentration. We have Adore English is saying communication and activities. We have Arleth, Gavin de Garcia saying planning is a metacognitive skill and lots of people giving greetings from all over the world. Great, thank you so much, everybody. We have also one more, Karima Biskiri saying collaboration skills. Thank you so much, everybody. Perfect, and you guys highlighted many of those metacognitive skills, and it's a long list because it really centers around skills that helps our students to perform tasks more independently and more critically. But I'm gonna focus in on 10 skills for the sake of time, we're just gonna look at 10. And those are task orientation, goal setting, problem solving, as um, many of you guys mentioned, self-questioning, self-awareness, concentration, so being able to focus and pay attention, planning, self-correction, self-evaluation, reading and listening comprehension. 
And I want to take a moment to focus in on two of these listed metacognitive skills. So problem solving and self-questioning. And I want to focus in on those two because these are the metacognitive skills I tend to work on first with my students when I first introduce them to the concept of metacognition. So when I introduce metacognition to my classroom, I first teach my students what metacognition is and what metacognitive skills are, just as I've gone over with you. So I'll talk with them about how their minds work and how it's working to make them better learners. Then I'll introduce them to a metacognitive self-questioning technique, which I believe is best practice with a fun game that we'll play in a bit. So let's look at that self, those self-questioning um, technique. So part of helping the brain develop its ability to monitor and evaluate itself is through self-questioning. The ability to ask ourselves questions helps us to develop our problem-solving skills. We have to teach our students how to ask themselves questions rather than waiting for the teacher to ask them prompting questions when they're trying to solve a problem. And we can provide them with a list as they're learning, when they're first learning about this skill, we can provide them with a list of questions they can ask themselves to guide and organize their thoughts. So as you see here, this list has questions that are teaching them how to focus. So first focusing in on what is the problem or what is the assignment asking me to do? How to gather information. So what do we know or what do we not know, but we really need to know? And once we've gathered that information, to ask ourselves, what are some possible steps we can take based on what we know? Then we have evaluate. Which of these possible approaches is best for this particular situation or problem? We want to teach our students how to ask themselves, what should I do first, second, or third? And is this working? And finally, we want to teach our students how to ask themselves at the end, did this work and how do we know? So we're going to use this guiding question list in our next metacognitive activity called Move the Circles. So I believe that it can be beneficial, particularly for young students or students with special learning needs, to first learn about metacognition and how to use self-questioning techniques with a low pressure fun game. But I find that adults and older students, they love learning this with games as well. So the game we have is move the circles. And the first thing you wanna do is you want to go over the objective, which is to get all the green tiles to the other side of the game board, one at a time, and to do the same for the yellow tiles. Then you want to go over the rules. So tiles can only jump over one tile at a time. Tiles can only move forward. Then let's look at some of the materials we can use. So if you want to play this game in more of a visual manner, this can be done as um, just drawing these seven blocks on the board um, and using colorful chalk or colorful markers. If you wanna play this game in a more tactile or hands-on way, you can have students draw these blocks in their notebook, these seven squares, or you can have it on a sheet of paper that you give your students, and then find some stones and paint them green and yellow, and students can play it at their desk. If you teach online virtually, this can be done. There are online frog jumping games, or you can also use um, the online whiteboard feature for different learning platforms. So the purpose of playing this game is to teach our students how to organize and monitor their thoughts using questions. We want to teach them how to be strategic when they are learning how to perform a task rather than guessing or just rushing to complete something. Okay, so I wanna play this game with you, Chris, just as I would play it with my students. Are you ready? Yes, yes, I'm ready. And we have a great comment too. Someone's like, yes, frog jump is a great idea to use online. But yes, I'm ready. Perfect. Awesome. And I'm glad that the audience is, audience is excited too. So Chris, what is the problem? 
Okay, um, I think the problem is that we need to get all of the tiles on the opposite side of the board, correct? Good, yes, exactly. So what do we know? Okay, so we know from the rules that you shared that the circles can only jump one tile at a time and they can never move backwards. Perfect. So Chris, looking at the board, what steps can you take? Okay, I can alternate between moving the yellow tiles and the green tiles, or I can also move a green tile first and then a yellow tile. Okay, well, which plan do you think will work best? Hmm, let's see. I think we should move the yellow tile and then the green tile. Okay, so what do you want to move first? So first, I'll move yellow three. And second, I want to move green three. And then I'll move yellow three, then green two. I'll do yellow, green, yellow, green. Okay, so let's do that. Let's move yellow three forward, green three, yellow three, and green two. Is this working? Oh, it's, it looks like no, it looks like it's not working. Okay, so let's start again and see what we can do differently the second time around. Okay, okay. Um, I think I know what we should do this time. So first, let's move yellow three. Next, let's move green three. Now we'll move green two. And now we can move yellow three. Okay, so it looks like you were able to see your mistake and fix it the second time around by pausing and taking time to plan out your steps. And this is what we want to teach our students to do, using guiding questions that train their minds how to pause, monitor their decisions, and reflect on their actions. So I want you and the audience to tell me what are other fun, low stress options for teaching strategic thinking skills? Yes, everybody, it's your turn. So that was super fun, uh, but we want to hear from you all. So what are some other fun, low stress options for teaching strategic thinking skills? What other games do you all play? We'd love to hear from you. So we have a nice comment coming in, Daria saying, great processing and orchestration of planning, monitoring and evaluation for the problem solving. Absolutely. And someone, um, other fun, low stress options for teaching strategic thinking skills. Uh, Dr. Azran says memory games. Okay. And also, yeah, we have uh, Luis Fernando also saying memory games. Absolutely. Ooh, we have someone, Alberto Gutierrez is saying the spaghetti marshmallow challenge. I'm not sure about that. I'd love to hear more about that. That sounds really interesting. <laughs> And other people are saying uh, playing games uh, like such as Kahoot or other online quizzes and games. Um, so lots of great responses. People are also saying different puzzles, lots of different uh, online games and memory games or um, games with different scenarios and different results. So great, great, everybody. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas. Yeah, thank you for sharing about those games and different activities. Puzzles are another great game. Um, uh, memory games, uh, information gaps, I see someone putting in. I've never heard of the spaghetti eating challenge, but that, that sounds fun. That sounds amazing. Um, so thank you. Okay, so now let's talk about the benefits of building our students' metacognitive skills. So building our students' metacognitive skills improves their executive functioning skills, and it also builds student-driven critical thinking. So executive functioning skills, which are controlled by the frontal lobe of the brain, helps us with focusing, so that concentration, remembering instructions, managing our emotions and reactions to situations, so self-regulation and being able to manage our impulses, and it helps us with organizing our thoughts. 
And students all have different levels of executive functioning skills. So I want you to pause and just kind of close your eyes and think about your students in your classroom. Do you ever have students that seem to fall apart emotionally or they shut down when an assignment seems too challenging? Do you have any students that struggle to figure out where to get started when you give them a multi-step assignment? Do you have students that just blurt out information? They struggle to control their emotions. They get angry quickly. Or maybe they struggle with remembering the instructions that you gave them. So these might be students with low executive functioning skills. And these students will often struggle to focus, to remember the instructions you gave. And when we strengthen our students' metacognitive skills, so concentration, self-awareness, self-correction, the ability to see their mistakes and make changes, we are also strengthening their self-regulation capabilities, which will allow them to be more organized, more focused, and better able to control their emotions. Building a student's metacognitive skills also puts the student in the driver's seat of their own mind instead of having the teacher drive their thoughts. So students stop trying to figure out what the teacher wants them to say or think, and they're given the space and opportunity to reflect on and make sense of the ideas that their unique minds are producing. Students learn how to reflect on their performance before, during, and after making an inference, solving a problem, or drawing a conclusion. And when we empower our students with metacognitive skills, their brains can more effectively learn from itself and students can become their own teachers. So now, I would love for you to tell us what will it look like in your classroom for your students to drive their own thinking? Yes, everybody, your turn again. So let us know what it would look like in your classroom for your students to drive your own thinking. Please let us know and share in the chat. And Daria, while we give our, our wonderful teachers an opportunity, our, our person Alberto Gutierrez, he shared with us what the spaghetti marshmallow game is. Um, he said it's from a TED talk where students are given strands of spaghetti and students have to make prototypes to create the tallest structure possible. So thank you, Alberto Gutierrez, for sharing with us. That's really cool. Yeah. Yes. So let's see, Doria, what it looks like in their classroom when students drive their own thinking. So we've got um, metacognition. Well, lots of people still commenting about um, the metacognition process and thinking about one own thinking or their awareness and understanding one own thought. Um, some people are saying that, you know, it will look different, but also challenging for their class. Um, another teacher, we have Cesar saying autonomous learners. That's what it will look like. Um, we have Luis Fernando Pirola saying using a bulletin board to express ideas. Hawa Magati is saying a more engaging classroom. Um, so lots of great ideas of teachers are sharing of what it would look like in their classroom when students drive their own thinking. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Wonderful. Yes, thank you for that. Um, and as some of you mentioned, yes, students become more autonomous and feel freer to share their creative thoughts. Um, and initially, it can feel a bit challenging and frustrating, but over time, students begin to appreciate the ability to um, think more independently. So now let's look at a few metacognitive activities. We're gonna take some time to talk about different activities you can do with your students to build metacognitive skills. We'll look at one warm-up activity that will build their problem-solving skills, a lesson activity that will build their reading and listening comprehension skills, and one wrap-up reflection activity that will build their self-questioning and self-awareness skills. So let's start with our warm-up activity called Dear Classmate Letters. So in this activity, the whole class or small groups will read out and discuss an academic problem that one of their classmates is having. So this is a writing and speaking activity. Students take time to reflect on and write a letter seeking advice about a problem they're having. And then the following day or week, 
the class will discuss and give verbal solutions to that problem. And now you, the teacher, you can create your own made up letter to add into the box if you're seeing a problem that many of your students are having, but nobody has written a letter about it. So let's look at the steps to this activity. So first you want to introduce um, an example letter. You want your students to have an idea of how to write their own letters. And we'll come back and read this letter later. Next, we want to review any grammar rules that students might need to know before writing their advice seeking letter. So you might want to teach them, um, teach them or review modals of advice, ability, necessity, and obligation. You might also want to provide them with some sentence stems they can use in the letter such as, I am confused by, it's hard for me to, I'm not sure if, do you think I should, I wonder if. Next, you want to provide some time, maybe around 15 minutes of class time for them to write their advice seeking letter. And you want to remind students not to put their names on the letters. These letters should remain anonymous. Have a box in your classroom where students can put the letters. And then after class, when you're by yourself, read over the letters and select the letters you want to use for the warm-up activity the following day or week. Then that following day or week, you want to read the letter together as a class. Then you want to review the metacognitive, those metacognitive guiding questions. Go through those questions with your students to prompt their memory. And then just select one to two guiding questions for students to focus on for that lesson. Next, you want to provide discussion sentence stems. So when students are preparing to give out their verbal solutions, you want to share out some sentence stems that students can use, such as first they should, they should either or they could, it might be best if, and so on and so forth. Then you want to put students in small groups and have them practice giving out their advice to the problem in small groups with their classmates. And then you wanna bring the class all together and as a whole class, students will share out and discuss their solutions to that problem. So Chris, I want to try this with you. So we're gonna read that example letter and practice coming up with a solution for our classmates. So the letter says, dear class, it's hard for me to speak in class. I am shy. I do not remember vocabulary words. What should I do? So Chris, what is the problem? Okay, the problem is that they are shy. They don't know how to get better at speaking in class. Yeah, exactly. That really seems to be the problem. So everyone out there in the audience, can you help our classmate find a solution to their problem? I've given you a, one of those sentence stems and I want you to tell us what are some possible steps they can take. Using that sentence stem, they should either blank or they could blank. Yes, everybody, it's your turn again. So what are some possible steps the student could take? So please share an idea with us. Feel free to use the sentence step shown on the slide. Share a solution for our classmate in the chat. So we'd love to share out your ideas. While we're allowing people to comment, Daria, we have lots of people just saying, what a wonderful idea, what a great activity. This is wonderful, I totally agree, I love this activity, this is great. Um, let's see what some teachers are saying. Um, one teacher is saying that they, they should either um, ask how they could help their students, or we have Edison Centura, Santa Cruz saying work first in pairs, then go into small groups, uh, do an ask and answer type of activity, or maybe try a different strategy if it doesn't work at first. Uh, we have Hilda saying that imagine that you're talking to your best friend. Oh, that's um, good. We have a few teachers saying like singing, singing or talking. Um, lots of different like small groups, whole groups, big groups, think, pair, share. Um, so lots of great ideas of how they would uh, address this problem. This is great, everybody. Thank you so much. 
Oh, that's really good advice. And so you see, as we're sharing advice for our classmates, it really energizes the classroom when students hear all this advice coming in about a problem that they've shared anonymously. And so I love this activity because it creates a classroom where students have time to reflect on academic problems they're having. And it also encourages students to work with each other, to solve their problems and to learn from each other rather than us as teachers, just lecturing our students about what they're doing wrong and what they need to do to fix the problem. The advice is coming from their peers, their classmates. So the advice will feel more authentic and relatable. The activity also empowers students to be the drivers in finding a solution to academic problems. So they're at the center of sharing the problem and finding the solution. Now let's look at how we can build another metacognitive skill during our classroom. So this activity, reciprocal teaching, focuses on reading and listening comprehension skills. Reciprocal teaching is an instructional technique that helps to develop comprehension skills. And this can be done to improve both reading and listening comprehension. But we're going to focus on reading comprehension for this example. With reciprocal teaching, students become like little teachers within their small groups. This approach pushes students to remain engaged and actively tackle challenges rather than just giving up when they're facing challenging reading or listening comprehension information. So, the first step is to create groups. You want to split your class into small groups. So, if you have a class of 100 students, split them into 25 groups with four students in each group. Now, if you teach a multi-level class with different proficiency levels in the class, create groups strategically so you have peer tutors in mixed proficiency groups. Next, you wanna assign student roles. So if you have 100 students, all 100 students will be topic ambassadors or experts in charge of leading a specific topic within their small group discussion. So we'll have a predict and infer ambassador, an asking question ambassador, a clarify and connect ambassador, and a summarize ambassador. Everybody has a role. Next. You want to read or listen to a piece of literature or article together as a class. You can also provide some time for students to reread the piece of article, the piece of literature or the article quietly to themselves. Next, you want to provide small group discussion worksheets. So each group will get a worksheet and this is the worksheet they'll use to document their responses during their small group discussion. You also want to provide them with some sentence stems they can use when they're coming up with their responses. And both of these, this worksheet and these sentence stems will be made available after the session in um, the uh, webinar resource center. So now, once you give each group their worksheet and their sentence stems, the group will have their small discussion. And the predict and infer ambassador will lead the small group in coming up with an inference or making a prediction on what will happen later in the story. And remember that inference should be rooted in what is in the text, what is in the story they've read. The question ambassador will gather questions from the group that will promote deeper thinking. And that role is so important because it's really important that our students are leading each other and coming up with good questions. That's one of those important skills is coming up with relevant questions. Your Clarify and Connect Ambassador is in charge of identifying areas where the group is confused and then leading the group and going back and finding clues in the text or audio that can help bring clarity to that area of confusion. And finally, our Summarize or, and React Ambassador is in charge of helping the group explain what they learned in their own words. Now, once the group has completed their worksheet and time is up, you wanna bring the class back together for a whole class discussion. And so you see here on the screen, you've got these different groups with these mixed proficiencies in each group. 
And each group has a predict ambassador, question, clarify, connect, and summary ambassador. So this discussion should be student-centered and we the teacher simply facilitate. So we're calling on the first student to start the discussion and we're keeping students focused as we rotate around the classroom. And so you, the teacher, might go ahead and call on the predict ambassador. And that predict ambassador can share out the prediction that their group made. And then afterwards, they can call on another predict ambassador to share out what predictions they made. And that predict ambassador can share their prediction and then call on a question ambassador to share out a question for the class. That question ambassador from another group can answer that question. And if they're having trouble answering that question, they can call on a Clarify and Connect ambassador from another group to help them improve their response if they're not fully sure about their answer. And it will go on and on with students calling on each other and asking questions and answering questions. And the discussion will be led by the students. So now, I want you to tell me, how can reciprocal teaching help your students become stronger, critical thinkers during reading and listening comprehension lessons? What a great activity you shared with us. Yes, yeah, so everybody, let us know. How can reciprocal teaching help your students become stronger, critical thinkers during reading and or listening comprehensions? We'd love to hear from you. So please share with us in the chat. So let's see, yeah, lots of people are saying there be a great activity to get learners engaged. We have one of our other teachers sharing a different type of activity that's quite similar, where they move experts in their groups and then back to their core group. So that's really wonderful. But yes, everybody, we want to hear from you. What do you think about reciprocal teaching and how can it help your students become stronger critical thinkers during reading and listening comprehensions? Please share with us in the chat. I'd love to share out with everybody what you are thinking. So let's see, we have um, Edison is saying, both parts become partners while reflecting on performance. We have a Kava saying, by analyzing what they learned and reading. Um, we have another teacher saying, we will lead them to be autonomous learners by self-regulating. So yes, this definitely, uh, reciprocal teaching definitely helps students become critical thinkers and um, during reading and listening. Thank you so much. So lots of people are saying lots of collaborative learning going on. I love it. It's great. So yeah, learning together is wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful comments, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys for sharing all of those ideas. And yes, it really does help students to become more autonomous learners. And I love this activity because every student must actively engage in helping their group better understand the text that they've either read or heard. And students are rewarded for asking questions and highlighting areas of confusion rather than pretending like they understood everything. Students learn how to identify an area of confusion and then look for clues to find the answers to themselves. So now, We'll talk briefly about using journals to build our students' knowledge of themselves and knowledge of strategies taught. So once again, it's really important to teach our students how to ask themselves questions to build their metacognitive skills of self-questioning, self-monitoring, self-evaluation, and planning. So it's important that we set time at the end of each lesson for students to pause and reflect on what they learned in class and then to create a plan for how they'll complete assignments such as homework or projects that are done outside of the classroom in order to strengthen their metacognitive skills. And we can support them through this process by providing them with guiding questions that they can use during their journal reflection time. And you'll see here that each of these questions hits on one, the, one of those six key areas. And so you can select one to two questions each class period for students to reflect on in their journals. And you can have your students create two sections in their journal. There's the knowledge of self part of the journal where students will reflect on who they are as learners, what learning challenges they're facing, 
their academic progress. So this is where they will pull those questions from the, from the guiding question list and they'll respond to them and come up with a plan for how they'll overcome any challenges they're facing, particularly when they're working independently. Then you have the strategy tracking part of the journal. And that's where they're writing down learning tools that they got. So that's where they're writing down strategy sentence, uh, strategies, sentence stems, guiding question lists, self-monitoring checklists, any learning tools that you give the students, they're going to put in their strategy tracking part of the journal. And when you have students write down a learning tool that they got, you also want to have them write a brief sentence about what the learning tool is. So they're not just copying things down. You want, to, you want them to think about how they can use or even improve that learning tool that you gave them. And it can be helpful to provide students with sentence, sentence starters, such as one strategy I learned today was dot, dot, dot. I can use blank strategy to help me with my next assignment. And first I will do dot, 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 and so on and so forth. So now let's talk about how to create a classroom culture of metacognition. And this involves three parts. This involves us, the teacher, modeling our process through think alouds during direct instruction. It involves us providing scaffolding supports to our students and also providing consistent opportunities of practice for students to become more aware of their own thinking. So with teacher modeling, it's important that we show how we have struggled with a problem or a concept. This creates a classroom that is a safe, sp safe space for students to learn from their mistakes and to ask questions. It is important that we as teachers be strategically vulnerable when teaching a new concept to our students. When we see that our students are making mistakes and not understanding a concept that we have taught, we should pause the lesson and include time for think alouds so that they can hear us think aloud about the process we use to learn that concept. You want your students to not feel frustrated when they are making mistakes, but rather to understand that learning is not magic or something that is always easy. Learning is a process that we as teachers have also gone through. So first, you wanna talk about a mistake that you have made or a misconception that you have had when learning about that concept you're teaching. You want to show the mistake and reflect on it. And you can say something like, I used to make this mistake because I had a hard time understanding that, that, that. Then you want to model the strategy that you use that helped you better understand where you were going wrong and what helped you to improve. You wanna put that strategy up on a wall or on a chalkboard, on a poster, and you wanna have students copy that strategy into their journals and their strategy tracking part of their journal. And you also want to model your process you want to model your process using that strategy. And this helps students to feel more comfortable in sharing that they're making a mistake and in getting help so they don't continue to make that mistake. So now I want you to share out as a teacher, how do you approach your own mistakes in the class? Yes, everybody, it's your turn again. So as a teacher, as Dorea says, how do you approach your own mistakes in class? I just want to tell you, Dorea, we've got lots of wonderful comments from our wonderful teachers in the audience, just loving this session, loving the strategies that you're sharing. So everyone's just super excited to try out these activities. But for now, we really want to hear from you all. How do you approach when you make mistakes in class? What do you guys do? Let's see. So we have Dr. Azran says, by asking questions to myself. That's how I oh, approach good. mistakes in my class. That's really good, Dr. Yeah. Azan. That's wonderful. Yeah, I know if when I make mistakes, I definitely have to own it up. And, you know, I let yeah. my students know that I made the mistakes myself and show, as you said, 
that we're all just human and that's how we learn by making mistakes exactly. so yeah, let, let us know everybody um yeah we have Nala Nassar saying that she acknowledges making the mistakes and then to check it absolutely that's, Nala, cool. that's great yeah. um and then we have uh, Karima saying, this is a real effective guide for our students to learn how to evaluate themselves. Thank you so much for sharing. That's great. So yeah, lots of teachers, they're just saying that they acknowledge in front of the class with their students that they're making mistakes. Um, and then they talk with their students about it. So that's great. Thank you so much, all you wonderful teachers out there for sharing. Perfect. Yes, thank you for sharing that because it's not easy as teachers to admit to the mistakes, but it's really powerful. And it gives our students hope because it shows them that we as teachers have made mistakes as we've learned a concept and they too will make mistakes, but that will learn from it and that will grow from those mistakes. So the next part to creating a classroom culture of metacognition is scaffolding. And this includes those posters and those charts with all strategies we've taught them. We wanna have those up on the wall. And we also want to make sure our students are noting those, are writing those into their journals. And that helps to develop a, the knowledge of strategy. I also wanna talk a little bit about using rubrics and self-monitoring checklists because rubrics and self-monitoring checklists help to build several of those metacognitive skills we discussed. So task orientation, planning, self-correction, self-evaluation skills. And we've been talking about using metacognitive guiding questions to help build their self-questioning skills. So these are four scaffolding resources that we want to provide to our students to help them become um, more uh, adept at metacognitive thought. So rubrics. I love using rubrics in the classroom, particularly when I'm working with students um, in the secondary level, college students and adult learners. Rubrics help students and teachers to have a common understanding of a task. So I've put up here an example rubric um, for writing an essay, an argumentative essay. And this rubric, it will help students and the teacher to know what they need to do to be successful. So it outlines what is proficient level, an advanced level, what is a beginning level and an approaching level. Now, while students are working on an assignment, it's also helpful to provide them with a checklist that outlines what they need to do to reach proficient or advanced level. The checklist we provide students is basically a to-do list that outlines the steps they need to take to be more successful on a task. So here in this assignment, this I've given my students a rubric that will be used to score their argumentative essays. So I will highlight um, in that checklist the six steps they need to take in order to have a strong essay claim. I have also highlighted the steps they need to take when gathering their textual evidence to receive high marks for evidentiary support. And so this um, checklist and rubric, example rubric will also be available in the webinar resource center. Now for older students that are working on tasks such as essay writing, creative writing, debates, et cetera, it's important that we provide them with checklists when they are first learning how to complete these tasks. But we also want to teach them how to make their own checklists as they become more familiar with these tasks and their individual learning needs when doing these assignments. I tend to use uh, another checklist, this checklist that just came up for students, um, younger students and students with low executive functioning skills to help them self-monitor and self-regulate their participation throughout the entire class session. And oftentimes I'll connect this checklist um, for younger students or students with special learning needs um, with a reward system because it really motivates them. So now let's do a recap of how we can introduce metacognition into our classrooms. First, you wanna teach students what metacognition is, because students are empowered by learning how their brains are actively working to make them better learners. 
Both my younger and older students enjoy learning about how their minds work. Then you want to introduce them to metacognitive guiding questions using low pressure fun games such as move the circles or as you guys mentioned, memory games, role playing games, puzzles, things like that. Then model your own learning process through think alouds. Next, you wanna provide consistent opportunities for students to practice their metacognitive thought and to build those metacognitive skills. You also wanna support your students with scaffolding resources and slowly release them to create these resources themselves as they become more independent. You also wanna provide self-reflection journaling time after each class lesson. This helps strengthen the brain's natural desire to pause so it can monitor and evaluate its own performance. So today we've discussed what metacognition is, the benefits of building metacognitive skills. We've gone over a few metacognitive activities and we've talked about how we can create a classroom culture of metacognition. So now as we wrap up, I would love for us just to pause and reflect on which of these metacognitive activities um, can you incorporate into your classroom routine to develop your students' metacognitive skills? Yes, everybody. So many wonderful activities that Darea shared with these with us today. So which of these great activities are you looking forward to incorporate into your classroom? So please let us know in the chat. So we've got Darea, lots of people are saying the journals, lots of the low stress games, all wonderful, wonderful ideas. Lots of people are just so excited and super impressed by your presentation today, Derea. It was truly amazing. So yeah, let us know everybody as we wrap up here, pause and reflect, and we hope that you use all these great activities that you shared with us and please incorporate them into your classroom routine to help develop your students' minute cognitive activities and skills. So yes, Derea, thank you so much for sharing these awesome approaches with us today to help students develop their metacognitive skills. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I have loved um, sharing and learning with you all today. It's been a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful.